So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me, and please strengthen me only this once, O God. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. This is the narrative. So you remember as a kid when you would play follow the leader, and it was always fun to be the leader, right? People had to do whatever you did, if it was jump or skip or roll or whatever it was. And I remember in preschool, maybe even you were so excited if you ever got to be the line leader, right? You just get people following you, there's something about it. When we talk about leaders, we're going to do that today in 1 Samuel. We're going to be in all over in 1 Samuel, but especially chapters 15 and 16. When we talk about leaders, we're going to look at two of Israel's uh, beginning leaders. We're going to look at uh, David and Saul. And, and as we, we think about them, I, I want to ask you this. What, what do you want in your leaders? What do you look for in leaders to follow? What kind of character do you want of those in charge of you? And so today we're going to look at two different leaders and compare them to the best leader ever, which is Jesus in the heart of kings today. Uh, last week we talked about Samson and there was a time in Israel where they were going through judges. And if you're in our Bible reading plan this week, we, we rolled into the kingdom of Israel and we saw the first king anointed, that was Saul. And then we saw the story of this other guy named David, who's going to be the second king. So as we walk through this, uh, we're going to find out why the Israelites wanted a king. So in 1 Samuel 8, they tell, uh, they tell Samuel, who's this prophet, the man of God, they say, we want a king, we want a king like all the other nations. And Samuel talks to God about it, and God's like, man, they really don't want a king. It's not going to go real well for them if they get a king. Uh, and Samuel tells them that, and they're like, no, we want a king. Samuel says, okay, well, he's going to take your sons and put them in the military. They're going to have to uh, drive his chariots and go and, and defend and all this. Your daughters are going to be in the palaces. They're going to be working. They're gonna be, he's going to be taking 20% of your crops and your money. And are you sure you want the king? And they're like, yes, we want the king. Why do they want the king? Because they want to be like the nations around them. They want to be like everybody else. I mean, God has already said they're special to him, but they want to be like everybody else. And they call for a king. And so God tells Samuel, hey, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So we'll give them a king even though that's not the best thing for them at this time. Uh, God gives them over to the desires of their heart. Uh, we see that in the New Testament. If we fast forward to Romans chapter 1, where God does that, when, when man goes after things that are unnatural and totally not godly, he turns them over to the lusts of their heart. And so he gives this to the Israelites. Now, when we talk about these two kings today, uh, Saul, the first one, and David, the second one, I want you to understand something. Uh, we're going to see Saul in a negative light. Okay, he's, he's, I just want to be, be fair and, and, and full disclosure here. There's some good things that Saul did for God more in the beginning of his kingship. So, so he does mostly bad and a little good. Now, David, on the other hand, does mostly good, but there's some doozies of bad that he does. We're going to talk about that for a little bit, too. And so we're going to see the difference between the two. So let's jump into that and, and look at these two, Saul and David. Saul was picked for his appearance. And David was picked for his heart. David was picked for his heart. So, so as we think about this, Saul was picked for his appearance. David was picked for his heart. We, we look all the way into uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. And, and before we get there, let me ask you this. Would you rather have a, a, a leader that looks good or is good? Uh, be good or look good? You're like, man, if you can get both of those, that'd be good. But, uh, you know, we're going to say be good. So as we look at these two today, the first fill in the blank is uh, picked for appearance or picked for heart. Right? And, and so in 1 Samuel 9, 2, it says this. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. 
Uh, so as we look at him being a head taller than anyone else, he's, uh, he's, he's chosen for his appearance. And you say, well, Jeff, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're reaching there because that's not really what is said. But we're going to see here in just a, a couple more verses that uh, that is what's being said. I, I think you have the wrong message up there. It should be this week's. So, uh, so just so we have notes and the scripture up on the screen. Uh, God wanted to give the Israelites someone who, who went after him. But instead, they're picking someone that looked the part, that was a head above everybody else. And this guy, uh, we see what God says in 1 Samuel 13, 14. Uh, he says this to the one that was chosen that way. He says, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So, so God is seeking out someone after his own heart because Saul, his heart wasn't the Lord's. And so when we look at this passage, we see that Saul was picked for something else. As a matter of fact, if we go into 1 Samuel 16, 7, great verse to memorize, where the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Ultimately, he's not real tall, and he's not going to get the best looking in Israel if there was a contest. I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at, right? People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the... Heart. So that's the difference between Saul and David. Everybody looked at Saul and said, oh man, he's, he, he's tall, he's good looking, reminds me of the pastor at Riverlawn. And I, you know, it's one of those things, I don't, I don't think that's actually in there. But uh, uh, you know, let's go for him. And God says, no way. You want someone with a heart that is after me. Another thing we see in the two comparisons here is, is Saul was in self-centered cowardice, whereas David was in God-centered bravery, Right? Uh, when Samuel told Saul he was going to be king, here's what Saul does. He answers, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? It's not my clan, the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you say such a thing to me? I don't want this. Why? I mean, I come from a small clan. Don't, don't pick me. And then we fast forward to where everyone gets together to um, say that Saul is king and they're looking for him. I mean, it's not hard. You can pick him out in a crowd, right? He's ahead above everybody else, but they can't find him. They're like, where's this dude at? And in 22, I can just see God rolling his eyes here. If God ever rolled his eyes, here's where he's rolling his eyes. In verse 22, so they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? Where's our king? And the Lord said, yep, he's over there hiding himself among the supplies. Go check where your Samsonites are and your American tourist uh, luggage. That's where you're going to find your king. He's hiding in the luggage. I mean, he, he reminds me, he, he really reminds me of a character. See if you guys can get this. <laughs> oh, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm <just scared. laughs> I need some courage. You know, I mean, type of thing. Right? He reminds me of the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz. And, and, and he's sitting there, and even though he just looks good and, and stands tall, he's hiding. He doesn't want to take leadership. Self-centered cowardice is what we see with him. Then we go a little farther down the road, and, and we see David, and we see his heart and his bravery, and they were centered on the Lord. Right? He, they were centered on the Lord. And, and there's a picture a little bit later on where, where we see a nine-foot giant come out. He's from Philistine, and you might know his name. You guys know his name? Goliath, right? So this nine-foot giant comes out, and he's challenging the Israelite army. So the Philistines are coming. They say, hey, this is how we're going to fight this battle. We're going to send out our best guy. You send out your best guy. Let's let them fight. And whoever wins that one fight gets to control. And all the Israelites were shaking in their boots. I mean, he's nine feet tall, right? I mean, this dude is massive. And they come out, and they're like, oh. Now, remember, David, remember, David's small. He says, I, I've rejected his height. I mean, don't, don't, uh, he's not going to be tall like Saul. And so David is a young man at this time, a, a very young man. And he comes to visit his brothers who are in the army because he's too young to be in the army. He's at home watching the sheep. He comes to check on him. Dad sends him. And he comes. He says, uh, he sees Goliath challenge everybody. And everybody kind of shaking their boots and hide. David's like, hey, what's going on here? What's up with that? This guy's, this guy's talking bad about our God. He goes in, he can't put on uh, the armor, and everybody's like, well, nobody's challenged him. David's like, I'll go against him. Bring it. You know, it's not the size of the dog, it's the size of the fight in the dog, right? And so David's like, I'll, I'll do it. And so we see this in, in 1 Samuel 17, where, where verses 37 and 45, uh, he talks about this. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. Let me take you back to next week. Remember when Samson 
We talked about him destroying a lion with his bare hands. It was all about him and him getting the glory. But here, David says, hey, God rescued me from the lion and the bear. He'll rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, so Saul's the king. This little young man comes in, can't even wear the armor. He's like, all right, go and may the Lord be with you. A few verses later, David goes out to the nine-foot giant and he says to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Watch out, buddy. I mean, David, David comes out and he says, I don't care what you're coming. You can come at me with, uh, with, with a bazooka. You can come at me with a Sherman tank. You can come at me with whatever you want. But I'm coming at you with the God of the angel armies. Who wins this battle? David's confident in the Lord. He has bravery because of the Lord. He stands up when everybody else was backing down. Another way we see these two compared is, is Saul celebrated self and, and David celebrated God. Saul celebrated self and David celebrated God. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 12, we read this. We see, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. Remember, Samuel's the prophet. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Hey, hey Saul's gone to make a big deal of himself. He's gone to set up this own monument for himself. And we look at Saul throughout his kingship, and he was jealous and angry. And if anybody, anybody said anything different than him or he, or he got scared of somebody, he would try to kill him. He even killed, one time he killed 85 priests and their families. Priests of God, not some other God. Priests of God. He killed them and their families because they had given bread to David. I mean, Saul was messed up because he was all about himself. Fast forward to David as king and how he celebrates God. And uh, let me tell you the story setting this up. So uh, David's king, this year's down the, the way, and, and the ark of God is not there with him. And so they're bringing the ark of God. Remember the presence of God through the, the tabernacle, and, and it's going to be in the temple here in a little bit. And, and they're bringing the ark of the God, and David is just celebrating. Matter of fact, he's in his pajamas. He's in his pajamas. He's in, he's in undergarments. I mean, if you guys all wore footy, footy pajamas here, everybody would say, man, that's a little weird, you know? They're getting their praise on, wearing their pink bunny ear Christmas story jammies. We think it was a little weird. Or if you showed up in a, in a little undershirt and uh, maybe some long johns, everybody would say, ah, that's a little weird. David didn't care because he's celebrating God. Matter of fact, we're going to see one of his wives, McCall, uh, she gets a little upset that he's doing that, thinks he's making a spectacle of himself. McCall was actually a daughter of Saul. There's all this stuff going on. It's a soap opera in the Bible a lot of times. But we're going to see him reply to her in his response here. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, and then 21 to 22. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. I mean, they were just, they were getting their, their praise on. They were just loving that the ark was coming. And then David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. And this, this is great. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I'll be held in honor. What a mentality. Hey, I'll become even more indignified than this. I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. You know what keeps so many of us from being who God wants us to be? We're not willing to die to ourselves. We're not willing to say, I'll be humiliated for myself if it gives God glory. We want to, we want to preserve self. We don't want to look weak. But David celebrated God. I mean, he had this mic drop moment with his wife. He's like, woman, psh, please, I will just become more undignified than this. It's about God. I love what he wrote in Psalm 119, 10, 11. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I mean, I, I'm all about you. You are my everything. You are the center of my universe. And, and everything I do, I, I want to put your word in my heart that I might not do anything against you because you matter so much to me. I want to celebrate you. Saul, he continually made excuses for his mistakes, whereas David brought about repentance in his life for his mistakes. God had told Saul to go and destroy all the Amalekites. 
and everything in their camp, their animals, their people, everything. And, and Saul goes, and we're going to read a little bit more about this here in just a second, but we're just going to read one verse on this now. In, in verse 15, he didn't destroy him, and, and Samuel says, hey, wait, I hear sheep. Uh, where, where are those coming from? And Saul answered, Oh, hey, that was the soldier's fault. They brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. So, so here Saul is that he is making excuses, blaming it on others who only did what he told them to do. And said, hey, but we, we, got, we got the good stuff for God. He made excuses for what he did. David, now, now I mentioned this, far from perfect, Right? We look at David. If you know the story of David, uh, there was this part in his life where he was just, man, he, he made some terrible decisions where they're just compounded, right? Have you ever made that one bad decision and then you're like, oh, I made that. So I, in order to keep that one going, I got to do this one. Oh, in order to do that, I got to do this. And, and before you know it, it's out of control and you've spun a web of lies and deceit that you're just like, how did I get here? That's what happens with David when he sees a woman from his rooftop. And decides to take her, even though she's married, gets her pregnant, and then sends for her husband, who is out fighting in the name of David to honor David's kingdom of Israel, brings him home. Hopefully, he'll sleep with her and get her pregnant, but that doesn't happen because he's, he's committed to the cause and says, I can't enjoy that while all my brothers are out battling. So then David's like, man, what am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll kill him. So he sends orders with him to go out to, back to the army, and, and he's told to be put at the front of the line and then draw back. So murder, lust, adultery, and some of us, we say, mm, David. And yet Jesus says, if we've hated anyone in our heart, we've committed murder. If we've looked at anyone or anything lustfully, we've committed adultery. But what I love about David in the midst of this, because he, he was far from perfect, but what he did do was Repent. And repent is when we, we change our hearts, we change our minds, and we say, God, I, I'm sorry, and I want to be about you and not me. One of the best psalms ever written was Psalm 51. And he starts that by saying, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. This was after he was confronted for what he did and all those things. Nathan the prophet had confronted him, and he, he writes this to God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Amen. God does not expect us to be perfect. There's only one who is perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. He does want us to admit when we mess up. He wants us to repent when we make mistakes. And... and I know, now don't take this personal, but I know that every one of us in here, everyone watching online has made a mistake in your relationship with God this week. I know it. Probably more than one. And God knows we're going to do that. He just wants us to be like David and have a heart that says, man, I'm so sorry, God. Please forgive me. Help me be who you want me to be. Another way that we see the difference between these two is Saul was half-heartedly committed. He was half-hearted in commitment to God, whereas as David was all in. Right? Let's go back to that story we were talking about. We're going to read verses 9 and 11 of, of 1 Samuel 15, where, where he's told to destroy everybody uh, and everything in the Amalekite camp. But it says, Saul and the army spared Agag, that's the king, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good, these they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. He says, let's keep the good stuff. Even though God said destroy it all, let's keep the good stuff. Let's get rid of everything that's weak. A couple of verses later, God tells Samuel, I regret that I've made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. It says, I regret that I made him king. Now, just so you know, God wasn't surprised. God didn't say, oh, I didn't see this coming. God knew what would happen from before time began. He knew where Saul would be. He knew what Saul would do. Another thing we see Saul do is when he wanted some answers, this is after Samuel had died, he wanted some answers, he turned to a witch. Not he turned into a witch, but he turned to a witch. 
right? In 1 Samuel 28, 7 and 8, uh, Saul said to his attendants, they wanted to find out some wisdom, and, and Saul says, find me a woman who is a medium, so not like in close size, but that's like a witchcraft medium, right? Find, find me a, a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There was one in Endor, they said, so Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night, he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. I mean, Saul was all over the place. But mostly, it was all about him because he wasn't committed all the way. Now, David, on the other hand, he was all in. He tried living for God and all he did. Now, he messed up. We've already covered that. But he tried living for God. You know, when Saul uh, was rejected as king, when God said, basically, man, I regret that I made him king and uh, I want someone that seeks after my heart and not necessarily looks the part but is the part, Samuel goes and he anoints David. And now Saul's still king, but Samuel goes and he's a little nervous that Saul will find out and kill him, but he goes and he anoints one of Jesse's kids. And they bring in the oldest to the youngest, which is David. And God said, that's him. So he anoints David. David knows he's going to be the second king of Israel. And so he grows up, he works for Saul a little bit. Well, then Saul gets really jealous of him, and uh, Saul wants to kill him, and he tries this multiple times. He's out seeking to kill David because everybody loves David, right? Long before everybody loved Raymond, everybody loved David. And, and they just thought he was great. They would sing songs about him, they would do all this stuff. And so Saul got really jealous, and he wants to kill David. So he's out hunting David. And David and his men are in the back of this cave, and it's a, it, it's a pretty big cave, right? And so David and his men are back there. He has hundreds of, of followers with him. And then Saul comes in the cave to relieve himself, right? Now, David and his men keep it together because most men would be like, <laughs> you know, I mean, type of thing, be junior high-ish. Most men are junior high-ish when they get around a bunch of other men. No offense, guys. I'm one of them. But they stay there, and Saul goes to the bathroom. And while he's going to the bathroom reading the Jerusalem Times, David walks up and cuts off a piece of his cloak. And then Saul leaves. And a little bit later on, he goes down to the army, and David stands out. He says, hey, Saul, man, I, I, I had the chance to take your life, but I didn't do it. All of his guys were so upset with David. They're like, David, God has given you the king. Go, take him now. There's nobody even around him. David says this in 1 Samuel 24, 6. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. David was all in. Even though he knew this was coming, he was going to be second in command, and, and he could have sped up the process, he's like, nope, it's the Lord's doing. It's up to him when that takes place. I'm going to be faithful to him. That happened a couple times where David could have taken Saul's life, and he doesn't. He didn't take it into his own hand. He even goes on in Psalm 27, 1. I love this where David wrote, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Well, half-hearted commitment versus all in. Where would you rank yourself in following God? Let's look at one more thing with Saul and David. A failed legacy and a lasting legacy. A failed legacy and a lasting legacy. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, it says, For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. I mean, really, when you have a king, their sons are supposed to be the next king, right? One of their sons, probably the oldest, supposed to be the next king. But Saul doesn't get that chance. Because the Lord has rejected him as king. His legacy failed. His legacy failed because he was all about himself. Now, if we go on to the next king of Israel, so we went, Saul's the first king, and then God, God's, he, he rejects Saul, he, Saul fails, then there's David who does a good job for the Lord. That's us up again, but he, he, he does a good job. And then David's son Solomon becomes the third king. And the third king of Israel is told this by God in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. As for you, Solomon, 
If you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness as David your father did, that's his legacy, walking with integrity of heart and uprightness, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. You know what's so cool about that? And there's so many people who don't believe the Bible, don't believe in God, don't believe these things. Here's another prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus' lineage came through David's line. And Jesus is still the ruling king of Israel and the world. It's a beautiful picture. But this lasting legacy of David is a beautiful thing. And we can see that and and learn from him, all the good stuff he did. And when we mess up, learn from his repentance and how he lived life there. Well, that leads us to that successor that is forever on that throne. The greatest king ever, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus. So as we look at the heart of Jesus, what can we learn from the heart of Jesus? Because Saul was bad, David was good, but Jesus is great and awesome and mighty. So what are some things we see there? First of all, his heart was motivated by love. His heart was motivated by love. Everything Jesus did was out of love, was to show the love of the Father, was to show people how to live a life that is set apart. He loved greatly. Matter of fact, John 15, 13, greater love is no one than this, Jesus said, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Why is that important? Because you and I needed someone to lay down their life for us. Why? Why? Because we've sinned against God and we broke our relationship with God when we went our own way. We, we became a lot like Saul when we've done our own thing. And, and God says there's nothing I can do or you can do that's enough to pay for the sin that we've committed in this world against him and his people. And the ultimate punishment for that sin is a very real place called hell. And that's where we are to go. And a lot of people, I got an email this week, uh, someone that was saying, man, I don't believe in hell. How could you do that? And this big, long email about, you know what, I just know I'm going to die and that's going to be it. I'm like, what miserable hope is there in that? And yet I know there's a hell because God has said it and over and over he has proven himself. And if you don't even believe uh, the word of God, you've got to believe the prophecies that have come true. But there's a real hell that we deserve to go to. But God didn't want us to go there. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, because God loved us. Jesus came and gave himself, laid down his life for all those who would take him as Lord and Savior, repent of their sins, say they're sorry, and ask for the blood of Jesus to cover over their sins will be forgiven. If you've never done that, we encourage you to text the word follow to the number on the screen. Uh, We'd love to talk to you about that. Because once Jesus takes away our sins, then the payment has been made through his sacrifice and we get to be back in relationship with God and get to be with him forever. It's a beautiful thing. But everything he did uh, was motivated by love. His healings were motivated by love. His teachings motivated by love. Uh, When he rebuked the religious leaders, motivated by love. Everything he did was motivated by love. He was the epitome of love. And his heart was demonstrated by sacrifice. His heart was demonstrated by sacrifice. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but, or he came as a ransom, and he did not come to be served, but to serve. Right? And to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's why Jesus came. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Motivated by love, demonstrated by sacrifice. He sacrificed so much to bring us back to God. He went through so much physically. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. For your sins, my sins, the sins of the world. What a wonderful king. So what about our hearts? What's the condition of our hearts? Where where are you at? Do you have more of a David heart or a Saul heart? Because a Saul heart is really what the world teaches us to have. A Saul heart is, it's all about me, I want mine, give me mine, I'll step on whoever I need to to get there, as long as it feels good, I'll do it. And a David heart is, man, God, I'm, I'm gonna dance in my undergarments for you. I'll become more undignified than this to tell others about you. When we become Christ followers, we're told that we're anointed by God and we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I wonder... It's something just for us to ponder. God said, I regret 
making Saul king. Does he regret giving us salvation in the Holy Spirit because we make it all about us and we don't live for him? Or does he delight in us even when we mess up as he did David? Well, how do we have a heart like David and not like Saul? How do we say, okay, I'm going to be like God's guy or God's gal and not for myself? First of all, we must desire him. We must desire him. We must long to be with him, long to be near him, long to spend time with him. I love the psalmist in Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? I mean, it's just like we can see that, a a thirsty deer that just wants to get to that water. How many of us desire God like that? Too often our desire for God is quieted by the distractions in our lives. Too often the, the, the quest to be near God, the desire to be with Him, it's quieted by doing the same sinful pattern over and over and over again. Too often, it's quieted by our selfishness. We make it about us. Maybe you're struggling forgiving someone. God says to forgive, but you say they don't deserve it. We must desire him and what he wants for our lives rather than what we want. Well, God doesn't understand. I have so much going on in my life. I, I, I need this drink. I need this hit. I need this pleasure. Yeah, but God says you don't. Be more like Saul and more like David in that. We need to desire him. I like what Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Right? I mean, let's feel, uh, I'm going to put my name in there and you guys put your name in there, right? Jeff has been crucified with Christ and Jeff no longer lives, but Christ lives in Jeff. The life Jeff now lives in the body, Jeff lives by faith in the Son of God who loved Jeff and gave himself for Jeff. That's how we're to live our lives. Desire him, crucify to ourselves, die to ourselves, and desire to live for him. And that's the next thing. We must live for him. We must live for him. Desire is not enough. I can desire to be perfect. I can desire to be the the strongest man in the world. No? Desire doesn't get you there. Living for him does. I would say it's not lip service, but life service. We're not to give God lip service, but life service. Can he see the way we live our life, that we are his or we're not? Do our actions show that? In John 15, Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Uh, Do we live it out? Do we keep his commands? Do we remain in his love? Because we're like, hey, it's about you. It's not about me. You know, Saul's anger and his jealousy opened the door for a tormenting spirit to come into his life. When we don't live for Christ, we live for self like Saul did, we open the door for so much to come into our lives that hurts our relationship with him. We need to be on guard of all distractions that come our way. There's a sad story that's come out in, in uh, the past few months that uh, really broke my heart. As a guy that uh, I've looked up to for decades, a uh, Christian apologist, which just means uh, defender of something you believe in, Ravi Zacharias. Ravi uh, ha- has done an amazing job getting people to see there is a God and the Bible is true and you need him. But the stories that have come out on Ravi since his death are disheartening. Put a black eye on Christianity because of the way that he was living outside the public eye. And, and I, I'm not here to judge Ravi Zacharias. I'm not here to say where he is today because that's between him and God. I do know scripture says teachers will be judged more strictly. He did a lot of good for God, but he was not living a life solely for God. And hurt so many people along the way and and gave such a bad witness to Christianity. One of the best apologists that we had for the faith. We must live for him and not just desire or say we are. 
Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Saul's world was built on sand. David's on the rock. Our world we live in today, built on sand. The Christ followers is to be built on the rock. Do we live for him? Do we live by the the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Do we live like that? If not, Christian, we need to repent like David did and be who he's called us to be. Let's pray. Father, we come today and we thank you for your word. Lord, it's so true, and you've proven it time and time again. Lord, we thank you for examples like David. Uh, show us, even though we've messed up before, even though we've uh, gone through rough times, that you still want to use us for your glory. Father, would you help us to be faithful to you? And if anybody here today is living like a Saul, would there be a transformation in their heart through your Holy Spirit? Maybe for the very first time they say yes to Jesus, or maybe they return to him and repent of where they've been. Father, would you be glorified in our lives today? We love you. And we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray.